Well, this morning I'm going to invite you to that text, uh, Acts chapter 12, and we're going to resume our walk through this particular text. Is uh, really today's passage kind of has just about everything in it in terms of uh, the account of. And I would say there's even a little comedy uh, in it as well when you observe some of the behavior of this uh, young servant girl. But it's also very tragic in terms of understanding uh, Herod's role in all of this and ultimately uh, the consequence uh, that he suffers as a result of his pride. And uh, it is um, a detail that Luke, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has recorded down for us of the opening days of that church with every intent and reason for us to know it. Uh, and I noted this even before as we were reading and studying Acts 12, the detail that is given to us is given to such a level that we're to actually see these things unfold for a purpose uh, so that we might connect with what God is doing, even in the midst of really the attempts on the part of man to destroy that which God is doing. And so I entitled it to the impotent against the omnipotent, that there is this Battle that's been going on since the garden, uh, even the rebellion of Satan uh, against God himself, of which man joined in that rebellion, that we have been struggling for dominion, uh, that somehow we're, we've got control over this. And really, uh, Herod is going to come to the end of it today. Uh, but for the church, it's going to be a great teaching moment. It's going to be a great moment of understanding of God's sovereignty uh, in it. And I think it's a, a very timely text, even for our own understanding of a lot of what we observe going on around us. Because it is very easy to fall into the, the dismay, uh, the confusion, uh, the frustration, uh, a lot of that that is going on in the talking heads around us that uh, believe they have all the answers, but yet can't solve a single one. Uh, but all it does is confound and confuse. Uh, it frustrates. But in Christ, there is the understanding of absolute. There is a clarity of seeing history with purpose and our role, our calling in it. And whether we're looking out at a, an unbelieving and rebellious world or whether we're looking even at ourselves in that context of a fallen world, uh, we're given great understanding of what it means to be a follower of Christ and what that looks like. And this is in the context of a narrative, simply observing how God is at work uh, through the context of the church. So as much as they're learning, we're learning as we observe and walk through this. So as we turn to Acts 12, we have really this moment of Peter coming to himself uh, in Acts 12. And, uh, uh, I, I kind of look at it this way. He's, he's literally waking up. It's kind of like that uh, sleepy fog. You ever get woken up and uh, just startled and you're kind of, you know, am I actually awake or am I just dreaming this? And when we, we left off uh, with verse 11, uh, Peter coming to himself, literally the idea of clarity here. Undoubtedly, he's now in, out in the night air. And uh, this night air is having an impact on it, as well as the fact that he finally gets to stop uh, in, in this hurried departure uh, from his cell, such that Peter realizes that this is not a dream, it's not a vision, but this is reality, that I truly am on the outside now of the gate. I am, I am free of this incarceration, which was supposed to be a maximum security lockdown. Uh, in human terms, there was no escape uh, possible in light of, of this lockdown. But by now, uh, you think of Peter, and Peter is probably well known to the authorities because he seems to have this problem with incarceration. He just seems to keep slipping out, uh, and he does it at really precarious moments, and to the embarrassment of those that are trying to lock him down. And I, you can only imagine Peter as he's digesting all of this, and of course, he ultimately recounts all of these details, and again, I think very deliberately, <clears throat> that he's, he's beginning to realize the significance of, wait a minute, here I am standing on the street. I am very well known. I'm known as a, an escapee uh, uh, historically. So they're going to recognize me, and uh, the risk of recapture is going to be, well, it's going to be elevated at this point, so I better get off the street. Uh, I should go uh, somewhere else. And so in this continuing narrative of the events for today, uh, we're going to observe, as a result of this great and miraculous work of God, how the believers, uh, King Herod, uh, Agrippa, and God, and even the church, are going to each respond uh, in light of this great moment of God's providential will being worked out in taking Peter out of what should have been an inescapable position and put him on the outside, such that he's now thinking, okay, here I am, I'm out, now what do I do? What is, what is my priority? 
And uh, by the way, for those that are keeping score, uh, Herod has already lost the first half, and he's about to lose the game, if you will, in this contest of the impotent against the omnipotent. And so as we break into it this morning, we're going to pick up in verse 12, and we're going to consider and really look in God's, on God's miraculous deliverance of Peter and how the believers, though I say celebrate, it's a, it's a celebration with a pause built into it because they're going to struggle a little bit with really understanding what has truly transpired. But when you get to verse 12, it says when he, again speaking of Peter, realized this, in other words, that this is all real, that this has actually happened, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together uh, and were praying. And so we observed the believers doing something phenomenal in light of a great persecution and one of their beloved actually being incarcerated and on the verge of, for the next day, probably was going to be put to death. And so what are they doing? But they're gathered in prayer, and Peter apparently knows where that gathering place is. And so as a point that we've already made earlier in this text, the church, uh, in light of this ongoing deadly persecution, and uh, we've already seen James being put to death, and now Peter being incarcerated, what does the church do? What do they do in light of such dire circumstances? Well, they gather in earnest prayer. And we, we talked a little about that picture here of earnest, that it's that muscle-stretching word. That this is a prayer of intensity. So they're very serious about this. They're very committed to this. And in that, recognizing, God, you're sovereign. Here's our circumstances. What do we do? How, does, how, does, how do things play out in light of your providential work? Now, this is a, a New Testament principle that uh, even uh, in our, our current times, we are being reminded. Uh, and by the way, there's several uh, side lessons we can really ping in on this. And one is for us as a church. Now, what do we do uh, in times of such contest? When times where we find uh, the body of Christ being assailed? Well, we have a great debate even going on among Christendom itself uh, in light of the restrictions, if you'll call them that, or the decrees, or whatever they we might want to call them, in relation to the church gathering. Uh, what is what is required? Now, I would say with clarity, we would understand that they are in the New Testament here, in Acts chapter 12, prohibited from worship. As a matter of fact, they're against the law. Uh, Peter's been arrested because of this. But when you think about their understanding of who they are in Christ and what they are to do, and even the, the terms by which they are called, they would see that this gathering, and especially for this act of worship and prayer, it was an essential attribute of being the church, of being the body of Christ. Uh, the, the scriptures use the term assembly. Well, assembly is a gathering. So by the term, it means gathering. We're called the fellowship. And of course, the fellowship, again, is a noun. Not only means a gathering, but it's a gathering of intimacy. It's a gathering of intimate knowledge of one another by which we can help one another, aid one another. We can look at somebody's eyes and say, you had a tough week. I want to pray for you. There's... So again, it is a word of close proximity in gathering. Uh, it is called a body. And of course, that simple illustration becomes problematic when you say, well, the body doesn't need to be together. Well, what happens if we begin to separate your body? You know, it doesn't work out well. So just, again, the, the descriptors that God has chosen to define this body of redeemed believers, each of them would call us to this gathering. God has defined these terms. We have not. Uh, and it is a place whereby the saved gather uh, to pray, to worship, to comfort, to edify, and to encourage one another. And that's what we're seeing here uh, in Acts 12 as this persecution is unfolding. James has been put to death. Peter is on the brink of it. And if you can think of it even from a higher view, when you understand of this work of salvation, that when we are saved, we are invited into community. We are invited into the community of the Trinity. And so there is a inherent risk uh, or, 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 or dichotomy even in our thinking for the saved not to gather because it is akin to the rejection of God himself or the community of God himself. And so we begin to understand church as community with God. We understand that that's what we do, and in that is all these other things, worship, prayer, and edification, and encouragement, and all these things. And so they're gathering together. This is why the Hebrew writer reminds his readers uh, in Hebrews 10, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Well, how do you do that when you're separated? 
Uh, and of course, his rebuke here, his correction is there are apparently some that are akin to this separating themselves, right? I don't need to gather. But he says, no, you need to be encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. And I, I notice that he, he tacks on this growing urgency. In other words, the importance of gathering is growing day by day. There, it, there's a greater urgency today than there was yesterday. Uh, there's a greater urgency this moment than there was a moment ago. It is because Jesus is returning and it is essential for his church to gather so that we might stir one another to love and good work, so that when he comes, he finds us as his bride, as his glorified bride, as that which he is doing a great and redeeming work in it. And so we, as individual components of that, as the redeem, are to invest ourselves in the one another uh, in the body for the sake of the body health, for the sake of the preparation for the coming of Christ. And this is why we gather. And we are to do it with an ever-growing sense of urgency, and we're reminded every day that that urgency, it should be building, by the way, in your, your observation of the world's events, that indeed we're, we're a day closer. I can say this, we're at least 2,000 years closer uh, than they were in Acts 12, and they thought it was going to be tomorrow. So we certainly should get a sense of that. So now we have Peter, he's free, and uh, his priority now is to get out of sight and to report to the church, to go back to the church with his details which we have recorded for us uh, in uh, Acts. And so he wants to go to them and make this report. He apparently knows where they would be uh, and where they, what they would be doing. Uh, Peter doesn't stop and consult uh, the local for directions and say, by the way, where is the church meeting in town? Uh, that would not work out well since they're illegal. But he knew where they would be. And uh, he is going to go and report to them. So Peter goes to check in with the believers to inform them of his freedom, and undoubtedly he knows that they are praying for him, and he wants to confirm from them that God has answered their prayers, that God hears and answers prayer, and he does it in a very remarkable way. Let me share with you the details. You know what? I was chained to two guards. There was only one way out, and there were two guards at that door. We went right on through that. Not only that, this gate of the city, it just opens. Nobody touches it. And when I finally come to my senses, here I am standing in the street in the night air, and I realize, well, you know what? I need to go to church. I need to go to church. And so he wants to confirm for them all that God has done, and really best, like, based on this level of detail that is recorded for us here in Acts 12, I, I have no doubt that to this account was an essential reminder to the church that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing uh, in Christ, uh, and in that... It, God does a miraculous work. He does a marvelous work as, as he answers prayer. And undoubtedly, we're going to see uh, repeatedly through the course of Acts, God is solidly in control. It never escapes him. It never goes outside of his control. And it is, by the way, that prayer, that model prayer for us, thy kingdom come, that we see, right? That God's will would unfold uh, in uh, even ourselves as it would in the world around us. Well, we go to the house of Mary, um, and we have um, uh, Peter going to the house of Mary, which was Peter's, uh, the mother of Peter's companion, John Mark, where many of the believers were gathered together and were praying for Peter's well-being and release, undoubtedly, and perhaps even for their own safety. Now, exactly, uh, Mary is one of those uh, prominent figures, yet not given a great detail, but I would say by observation, we would say she was a woman by some means. Uh, she undoubtedly has servants, or at least has one, who Rhoda is going to become a principal player here in a moment. And it was large enough to accommodate this many believers. I don't know how many, but there were many. And Luke identifies that in many. Of course, Luke would talk about thousands. So I, I can't imagine that, well, there could be. But uh, undoubtedly, they're packed in there. And I don't think they were maintaining social distancing. But uh, they're all in there praying. And uh, Peter makes his way to uh, her house. And again, he knows that this is where they would be gathered. But when Ma Peter gets to Mary's house, we see in verse 13, he knocks at the door of the gateway, and a servant girl named Rhoda uh, comes to answer that door. And so, again, there's a door knocker there. How he's knocking, we're not given that specific detail. But it does draw the attention of the servant, and she uh, naturally goes to that door and asks, who is there at this hour of the night? And uh, by, by, by timing, it's probably well into the evening at this point. Uh, in terms of um, uh, they were sleeping. Of course, Peter was sleeping. The guards were sleeping when the angel uh, woke him up for his quick departure here. 
But uh, he is uh, knocking at the door. She comes to it and says, okay, <clears throat> who's there? And Peter, of course, identifies himself. But notice, <clears throat> this is where it gets a little comical. Instead of opening the gate for him, you look at verse 14, she recognizes it's Peter's voice. So she knows who it is in terms of, I've heard that voice. I recognize that voice. But in her joy, in other words, she's having a yippee moment. She doesn't open the gate, but she runs in reports that Peter was standing at the gate. <laughs> And you can only imagine Peter's thoughts at this moment. Uh, Rhoda, <laughs> what's going on here? Uh, but she recognizes it's Peter and runs back to give this report. And here's, here's a, a, you know, there's always a crisis of belief, even when we're praying to an end. In other words, God, my prayer is that this would come about. What do you do when God answers your prayer directly and specifically? What is your response? <clears throat> so mustering up all the faith behind their prayers in light of Rhoda's coming in and saying, Peter's standing at the gate, you see in verse 15, they say, you're out of your mind. You're out of your mind. Now, <clears throat> I, I almost kind of want to read that kind of like in, in the vernacular of the more common. It's like, get out of here. Right? you got to be kidding me, you know? In other words, it's not so much an issue of unbelief as is an issue of awe. And by the way, that's how they're going to ultimately respond. It's going to be an issue of awe. That they're, they're just simply cannot believe in the human sense that truly, truly Peter is standing a gate, at the gate. Now, they knew perfectly well, uh, in their minds, Peter's still in jail, right? He's locked in Herod's security, maximum security lockdown. Uh, but undaunted, she keeps insisting that it was so. And I'm, I'm thinking of this, you know, this is kind of like a sitcom going on here, because Peter's at the gate. If you want to know if he's actually at the gate, go look, right? But there's this conversation that persists. They say, you're out of your mind. She keeps insisting that it was, was so. And even in despite of her insistence, they still were not ready to accept the fact that God had answered their prayers or just are overwhelmed by the, that possibility. And they're not only accusing Rhoda of losing her senses or escaping those senses, but then they go on to say, well, it's his angel, they suggested, which is ironic when you think about they're, they're more apt to, to accept that it's some sort of apparition rather than it is the possibility that it could actually be Peter. And I, I thought that's kind of an interesting response. Now, in Jewish thought, they had a very strong uh, belief in guardian angels. Uh, they believed that there were ministering angels for, for each of us. And uh, the commentary would suggest that they, they believed this was a very specific angel. Uh, this was uh, uh, Peter's representative. But even I'm, I'm thinking, which is less miraculous? Why would you suggest one over the other? Uh, in other words, we're, we're, we'll assume it's some sort of apparition before we'll assume that it's in, in Peter's thought. So they offer one remarkable possibility in denial of the other. In other words, we just can't get our minds around the fact that Peter would physically be, be standing there. And so it may be slightly humorous uh, in its moment, but here's the, the real Peter. He's left in this very awkward and dangerous position in verse 16. He has no other option but to continue knocking. Yeah. Uh, Rhoda, I'm still outside. I'm still out here, and, and no doubt hoping that he does not draw undue attention to himself. Again, he's very identifiable. Obviously, Rhoda recognizes him right off uh, and, and get arrested again, or draw the attention of the authorities even to the church. And so you could think there's a lot of things that are playing out here. But finally, Rhoda is able to persuade the others to come and see for themselves. And I would say, again, why wouldn't you begin there that uh, they would just run out to find out? But finally convinced, uh, when they opened the door there, they opened the gate, they saw him and were amazed. And, uh, and I would say probably much to Peter's relief, but they're amazed. And here is Peter standing in flesh and blood, indeed an answer uh, to their prayer. A divine event has taken place, and they are now witnessing the physical manifestation of that in the life of Peter being preserved. And so his... Again, inability to enter even without opening the door might show some apprehension on their part concerning a fear of being arrested themselves. But un undoubtedly, what a moment it was for them as they look. Now, what, what happens when excitement begins to hit a group of people, right? It's kind of like breaking into the hen house, right? The, the noise made by the overjoyed believers threatened to do what Peter's knocking uh, had not, and that was to arouse the neighbors and get Peter recaptured, right? And uh, I'm thinking there's Peter, you know, in, in our example, bringing finger to lips. Shh, quiet. <laughs> Stop. Right. Verse 17, there's this motion hurriedly to them he, with his hand to be silent. But he goes on to describe to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. So there's this buzz around him, undoubtedly, as they're going back inside. He's recounting uh, the great details of what has taken place. 
And he goes on to tell them this needs to be passed on. This needs to be communicated uh, to uh, the, the church. Tell these things to James and to the brothers. Uh, and of course, at that point, he departs and goes to another place. So Peter quickly recounts this amazing story of his escape. It's something that's recorded even for us uh, in Acts. Uh, undoubtedly, it would bring great encouragement to the church to see God work in such a marvelous way, even to their own unbelief, to the challenge of their own belief, that they could pray with such earnestness and see God provide so miraculously, uh, so much so that they would stand there really exposed in their own unbelief, uh, that it would just be a cause for rejoicing in terms of what God had done. And so Peter goes on to say, I want you to report this news to James, obviously not the martyr of James, but this is the brother uh, of the Lord who's leading uh, the Jerusalem church. And uh, in Acts 15, we're going to learn more of him and his ministry uh, as he's doing the work there. But having done that, uh, Peter very prudently departs. Him. He goes to another place. Again, he doesn't want to pull the fellow believers uh, into jeopardy. And probably even while it's still night, he wants to make his way to perhaps what is a Christian safe house. Is the only thing I could imagine. Where do you go uh, to um, stay out of sight of uh, a king who really wants you dead? Well, regardless of where he went, Peter now fades really from the narrative uh, in the scene as far as the record of Acts is concerned. We're only going to see him uh, mentioned one more time. There's going to be a brief appearance uh, in Acts 15. Uh, but from uh, here on out, the story is now going to begin to shift to the Apostle Paul and his ministry. And so kind of like Peter's going out on a big note here. This is uh, just a, what a way to uh, go out from the scene. But, of course, not everyone is happy concerning this great turn of events. Uh, some would have had it turn out a little bit different. And uh, Herod's going to retaliate. And, uh, by the way, Herod can't reach God. And so he's going to retaliate against all those that he can. We have Peter's sudden and mysterious uh, disappearance from this maximum security guarded cell. And you can only imagine when they wake up that it's going to cause quite an uproar among the, the guards, because for a guard to lose a prisoner meant certain death. And you get to verse 18, when the next day came, Luke informs us, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter, undoubtedly. They're all recognizing that what this means. Uh, they frantically turned the prison upside down. Uh, and how big is the prison and how far did they look? We don't know. But uh, there's this uh, two accounts of, of looking for him. Uh, the not finding him, not only on their part, but also on, her on Herod's, because, again, they can't find Peter. Uh, they eventually are going to have to report that to Herod, and it is where, verse 19, we see their worst fears are realized. As Herod, having made a search himself for Peter, how does he do that? Uncertain, but it's, it's unsuccessful. He then turns his fury on these unfortunate guards, and so he examines the sentries, and he orders that they should be put to death. And so there's no compassion on his part. Uh, Herod was a suspicious man, uh, and the guards could have offered no reasonable explanation for Peter's escape. How do you explain it? You're going to go to Herod and say, well, it's a supernatural event, Herod. God got you on this one. Uh, that would get you killed, too. But Herod certainly was not going to acknowledge God's uh, supernatural deliverance of Peter. And so to have, by the way, if you remember what his point was, is to take Peter and make a spectacle of him. Right? He was to be used to endear himself to the religious leaders uh, among the Jews. And so he's lost that, that uh, card uh, in this game. And so after court-martialing and executing the, uh, the guards, uh, Herod in some apparent, again, why does, why does Luke give us this detail? Again, to, to see God at work. But he, uh, some would suggest probably even in a huff, he goes down from Judea to Caesarea uh, and spends some time there. So he's going to take a vacation, right? Why not? It's, it's stressful for Herod in his position. Uh, and when somebody escapes captivity on you, you know, what do you do? Uh, you go on vacation. And so his plans have blown up in his face. Uh, he, he separates himself from it. But unfortunately for him, he still failed to learn that he could not fight against God, uh, nor could he even seek God's glory for himself. Uh, and, and so it should have been a moment for Herod uh, in light of God's providence, but it wasn't. Matter of fact, his heart, heart is so hardened against God that he's going to dare to even make claims that God's going to deal with him. But the mistake, again, which cost him Peter uh, and his prestige with the Jews was about to cost him his very life. And so in light of Herod's arrogance, uh, we're going to see that God is going to judge. Now, it is believed that probably several months have passed since Peter's escape. 
Again, for reasons not identified for us, Herod becomes, in verse 20, angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. And so there's this dispute that is going on. Now, they're not within his jurisdiction, but they are uh, the gateway for food. And that's going to play out here. And really, since Old Testament times, their country had depended upon the king's country for food. And so they depended on his good nature uh, for the chuck wagon to get through. And so if Herod is upset uh, with them, if he was to somehow bring about an embargo upon them, uh, it would be very problematic uh, for those two, uh, two nations. So realizing the danger of having Herod irate with them, they come to him with one accord, and having persuaded Blastus, and so this is the assistant, the king's chamberlain, uh, they ask for peace, uh, desiring an audience with him to make it, make it okay between them. So whatever this activity that's going on, again, we're not given those, those uh, backstory uh, issues, whether there is a blockade or even the threat of it, recognizing that it would be potentially crippling to them, uh, they want to make peace with Herod. So in this context, um, they uh, persuaded, and, and most likely some sort of bribe is involved, blasts the king's chamberlain to uh, act as the intermediary to uh, allow this moment where they could have the king's ear and uh, plead their case. And so Herod agrees to terms, but to further demonstrate his prowess, uh, he subjected the ambassadors from the two cities to a spectacle. And so, you know, there's nothing like a uh, the rooster, you know, thinking he's got the upper hand uh, in uh, uh, the chicken coop, you know, he's going to crow a little. And there is a day, uh, verse 21, on an appointed day, according to uh, the Jewish historian Josephus, this occasion was a feast in honor of Herod's patron, in other words, the one who put him into power, the Roman Emperor Claudius. And so it was a day for speeches and parades. And so now he's got this involuntary or voluntary audience now that he's going to bloviate in front of uh, in all of his splendor about his greatness. And so they meet in the amphitheater uh, and uh, that Agrippa's grandfather had built uh, and, uh, and he's going to begin to make this expression. I wanted to go back because we actually have some additional historical information that is given to us through Josephus, who wrote at this time. But uh, listen to the descriptor of what is taking place. Herod, again, puts on a garment made wholly of silver and of a contexture truly wonderful. And he came into the theater early in the morning, at which time the silver of his garment, being illuminated by the fresh reflection of the sun's rays upon it, shone out after a surprising manner. In other words, this was a man was, was a splendor to look at. And of course, Herod knew that. And so he dresses all in silver. And like it would actually be a little weighty, but nonetheless, uh, he comes out uh, in all. So he's making a show of it. This is a day for speeches and parades. And so Herod has is, is got his audience and he's going to go out uh, in, uh, in style here and, and make a great day of it. So Overwhelmed by his splendor, or more likely they're seeking to flatter him, his audience, in verse 22, they respond by saying, this is the voice of a God and not of a man. Kind of sounds like some of our political gatherings today, right? This is the voice of a God and not of a man. And Josephus actually records his response was not to correct them. He did neither rebuke them nor reject their impious flattery. In other words, okay, I can handle this. He's a good politician, right? Uh, of the bad type. He sits there and accepts the flattery. And he says, indeed, I am. But God has an issue with that. And God's response is very swift in verse 23. Uh, immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. Uh, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. Kind of a, uh, not the way he wanted to end his day and certainly not the way to end his speech and parade. And so we're not given any greater detail concerning the nature of Herod's dying in the text, uh, nor even these worms that consumed him. And there is a lot of speculation on this. And if you read the commentaries, they'll take you just about every direction. But I would say most of them will naturalize it. And what do I mean by that? They'll say this judgment is simply a natural event that happened uh, in Herod's life, rather than recognizing supernatural. And I believe this is what God wants to show. That indeed, it's like Ananias and Sapphira, right? It was a moment where God said, you're done. No more. And God chose the way that this would come about. And so I'm inclined to let the supernatural be the supernatural. The omnipotent be the omnipotent. And when this angelic host, whoever this was, uh, struck Herod, it was at that moment that Herod's life uh, came uh, towards its end. Now, it apparently, it was a, uh, there was some time involved. But 
this descriptor of worms, even, as they would be seen, and, and I want to, this is where I would say see them in the supernatural sense. They are given to us as an instrument of judgment. Uh, Mark chapter 9, uh, it's repeated, uh, depending on your translation, actually twice in uh, chapter 9. But in particular in verse 8, speaking of hell, it is the place where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And that's why I go back to this is whatever this instrument of dying that Herod went through was, it was a personal act of judgment on the part of God in which all of unbelieving who reject God will ultimately find themselves being in torment of. And so the usage is interesting because the worm here is very personal uh, and it is very perpetual. Uh, its presence in torment never ends. Uh, it is an affliction of their own arrogance. It is an agent of God's eternal and supernatural judgment. And so uh, even according to Josephus, as he would observe this, Herod lingered on for five days uh, in this dying experience. And there's a sim similar event that is spoken of uh, in the Old Testament prophets and also renewed for us uh, in Revelation concerning when the Lord returns. And he speaks judgment against the nations, that they will experience a very similar uh, dying, very similar terminology is used. So again, all that to say, let the supernatural be the supernatural. Uh, God said, Herod, I'm done with you. you you've gone to the point of, of exhausting my patience with you. You'll even dare to stand up and, and presume upon my glory. You're going to lose your very life. And so as a result, among all his pomp and majesty, uh, Herod suffers a very humiliating and shameful death. And so would it end the reign and the life of the man who had dared to touch two of God's apostles. And again, that's put into the, the recounting of Acts. So that the church, I believe, for all generations will understand God is sovereign. God is always sovereign, uh, and don't, don't, don't be concerned about the pompous bloviators who stand up uh, and say, indeed, I am God, uh, and, I, and I've got this all under control. God, indeed, will deal with those. Uh, our prayer is, is that they would repent uh, and that they would see, uh, and Herod had a great opportunity for that, uh, but that they would repent and see, indeed, there is one who can uh, forgive them from and pre uh, preserve them from the judgment to come. So his crime for which he was executed in judgment uh, is spelled out very clearly for us that he did not give God uh, the glory. And uh, the, by the way, uh, again, making this connection to divine judgment, this is the very same crime for which all the unregenerate who reject God will also be condemned. Uh, the great uh, statement concerning uh, the, the, the natural man and how we deal with the witness of God. You think of Herod and what he observed uh, in this miraculous preservation of Peter, even what he's observed up to this point uh, in the work and the growth of the church. Uh, God is revealing himself all around us. The testimony is truly about us. Paul tells us this. This is in Romans 1 and 18 through 23. He says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And so God reveals there is a wrath to come. He makes these things known. And yet, what are we but true suppressors? We suppress that witness. Verse 19, For what can be known about God is plain to them. I don't think Herod suffered from seeing this was miraculous. I don't think there's any struggle on his part. And the reason being, God is the one who has shown it to them. So it's not even like Paul is saying to the Romans, this truth revealing is, is the work of the church, even, or you or I. Uh, in this, God himself has made this known to them. God has shown this to them. Verse 20, even his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly perceived. So they've seen it very clearly ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so that they are without excuse. So there is no human being who has ever lived who has not had the testimony of God's greatness and power not made known to them, because God himself has done that. And so no one can stand before the throne of God one day and say, well, I didn't know. I was No, Paul says, what you did with that is you suppressed it. Well, verse 21, here comes the judgment. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God, or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking. Kind of sounds like our world today. They go off into this, this confusion, this, this lost thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened, it deepened in the rebellion. And claiming to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And much like Herod, they take that which is God's and they, they claim it for themselves, or they distribute it to something within the creation. And God says, this is a cause for judgment. This is why man will one day find himself before the judgment seat. And apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ, uh, they will be found fully, completely, and utterly culpable uh, for their rejection of God's glory. 
So Herod, in his arrogance, uh, asked for and received, if you will, a head start on his eternal state. And so, again, ends his uh, inglorious moment uh, in history. But for the church, Luke tells us, in spite of Herod's best efforts, even to rob God of his glory, uh, God's word increases. Uh, And so, again, speaking of God's providence, Luke keeps us on track with the crowds, uh, the church's growth uh, in number by reporting that despite the furious and vain attempts uh, opposed uh, in the opposition of men, verse 24, the word of God increased and multiplied. You just can't stop it. The king's best efforts could not stop its spread. Jesus Christ was building his church in the very gates of hell. Death itself could not prevail against it, could not prevent it coming to pass. And after stating the fact that God's purposes cannot be frustrated, Luke cites as an example of the church continuing in verse 25, because now we're going to set the stage for the foregoing chapters. Barnabas and Saul uh, returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service. And the idea here is not only have they completed that which they Uh, had done back up in the the establishment of the Gentiles uh, in their church in Antioch, but also in the bringing of relief to Jerusalem. Remember, there's a famine in the land. Uh, When you you talk about uh, Tyre, and uh, and these these nations are in the midst of that famine. And so it's a very very, uh, opportune moment for them, or very critical moment for them, in terms of getting Herod to uh, not deny them food. But for Barnabas and Saul... They had completed their mission of bringing this famine relief to Jerusalem, again, back to chapter 11. And that mission took place uh, uh, and and comes to a conclusion after Herod's death here. Uh, He dies, but the church lives on. Uh, The ministry continues. And so even with his best effort, uh, it it continues. And uh, Luke uh, introduces us then to a new face. uh, As he notes, uh, they came bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. And he'll become a, a key figure here. Uh, going forward. We actually learn about him later on. Also in Colossians 4, uh, we learn that uh, Barnabas uh, and John were cousins. John Mark were cousins. So there, it's relation here. Uh, and so he accompanies them on the relief mission uh, to Jerusalem. Uh, he's also going to accompany them on their first missionary journey. Uh, we'll also find him to be a little bit of a lightning rod uh, as he's going to have a defection issue uh, during that journey, probably because of his immaturity uh, and youthfulness. But eventually uh, he's, he'll be reunited uh, into that uh, and he's going to create, uh, in, in light of that uh, departure, a rift between Paul and Barnabas. Uh, but we'll see that in chapter 15. More on that later. So not only does this serve as an introduction to us, uh, to John Mark, and really a transition to the Apostle Paul, but uh, it really serves as a, a very important transition in terms of the gospel witness now going out into the world uh, at large. And so it uh, inter- reintroduces us to the Apostle Paul, uh, who is ministry really the rest of the of the the narrative is going to to follow. Well, I want to kind of conclude, and like I said, there's there's some really amazing uh, side lessons that we can draw our attention to. One of them is certainly the church gathering, uh, that uh, it is what we are. Uh, It is even in our name uh, as an assembly that we we gather for the purpose of edification, the building up of the body of Christ, uh, maturing uh, in the faith. Uh, It is why God has gifted to the church those who would teach the word of God so that the the body would grow in that, all in preparation of the urgency of the coming of Jesus Christ. And there's more even yet. But I want to go back to this battle of the the impotent versus the omnipotent. And I want to really conclude with this this thought. The scripture that I want to leave you with uh, comes out of Isaiah 45 in verse 23 because it is actually repeated uh, in the New Testament for us, at least on two occasions. Every knee shall bow. It originates from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Uh, In the last half of the book of Isaiah, chapters 40 through 66, again, a very flash overview, God prophesies through Isaiah uh, that there will be a coming comfort for his people. In other words, there is a day coming uh, where God will gather his people uh, from exile uh, and bring them back into this, this covenant And as a result, he makes this, or in this context, he makes this statement. And the phrase here, in particular, that I want to ping on is found in Isaiah 45, verse 23, which reads, By myself I have sworn, God is speaking, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. In other words, it's going to happen. My word will come to pass. It's gone out. To me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. That's comprehensive. That is complete, uh, and it will happen. 
The main thrust, again, of the overall passage is that God is the only one who can save his people as opposed to these idols that they keep falling into. And clearly, God is God and there is no other. That's the great argument here. And everyone will ultimately recognize that. Those will be the ones that will not be ashamed. Those who will not be ashamed are those who do that now, who recognize him now. That was the invitation to the Israelites. Do that now. Return to me. The bottom line is that before God, every knee shall bow and every tongue will swear allegiance to God. They will recognize him as such. The Apostle Paul then quotes this passage twice in his writing. Once in Romans 14, verse 11, and again in Philippians 2, 10, 11. I want to hit those two very briefly and then bring it together. In the Romans context, Paul is writing about Christian liberty. He's talking to us when he makes this statement. The Christian, in summary, is not to pass judgment on his brother or sister in Christ over issues of liberty. What are those issues? Well, the examples that he speaks of uh, that are given in the text are these dietary habits and religious days of observance. In other words, we're going to struggle with those from time to time. Some of those are issues of maturity. Some of those are uh, events, uh, come out of uh, where we're saved from or, or, or how we're growing uh, in our faith in Christ. And so we are to understand that all are going to recognize this, this, the truth uh, in Christ uh, and as a result, we show grace. Well, in these things to which the Lord, again, gave no specific command, these particular observances and food items, we should not stand in judgment of our brothers and sisters in Christ, because every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The truth will prevail. The other quote in Philippians 2, 10 and 11 comes in a what we call that wonderful Christological passage, the overall context of which is the call to Christian humility and how we should not consider ourselves better than others. Rather, we should look out for the interest of others above our own. Verses 5 through 11. Paul uses Christ as the ultimate example of humility that we should follow. It was Christ who, being in the very form of God, who emptied himself and took on the form of a servant. In doing so, he became obedient to God to the point of death. This is our example. This is the one that we are following. This he did for the sake of us, his people so that we might be saved. And it is important to note the overarching theme of the passage, the humiliation, and then the subsequent exaltation of Christ. Christ first humbles himself and then submits himself in complete obedience to the Father, and then afterwards the Father highly exalts him above all things. We as a church follow that example. We humble ourselves. It is here that Paul cites Isaiah 45, verse 23, to say that at the feet of Jesus Christ, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is the Lord, to the glory of God the Father. We will all recognize him for who he is. And so both of these are giving us an understanding that it all centers around the person of Jesus Christ, that God is God and we are not. And in all of these questions of, of, of faith, all these questions of understanding, it all centers around the exalted one, and that is the person of Jesus Christ. So in both of these citations of Isaiah 45, verse 23, he's echoing the truth to the church, that which God spoke to Israel that there will come a time when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess to the glory of God. For us as a church, it'll be affirmation. It'll be celebration. It'll be a recognition of the greatness of his work. When the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords returns to this earth, then will come true what the prophet Isaiah foretold all those years ago. Again, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear allegiance. The impotent will bow before the omnipotent. And so either in judgment or in celebration. And this is when the attempted insurrection will finally come to an end, when Christ is upon the throne. So the great lesson, I would say, for Herod, for Peter, for the church, for all those living in the here and now, is that we are living in this great moment of opportunity, knowing this will be the reality for all creation, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. It is an appeal to the Herods amongst us, as much as it is to the church among us, to understand now is the great opportunity. This is the great moment of God's grace, giving us opportunity to be the recipients of his mercy and the forgiveness of sins. For the unbelievers among us, we must heed the warning of the writer of Hebrews. Hebrews 3, verses 7 through 11 says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, who's speaking here? God himself, the Spirit of God. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion on the days of the testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. 
Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they will always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Sounds like Romans 1 played out. What is it saying to us but to understand? Listen now. Hear the urgency. Look at the testimony of all those things that are recorded for us in Scripture. Paul makes that remark. It's there for your, for your observation so that you might know how to live. For the Hebrew writer, he says to his Jewish brethren, simply look to history and let's not be like those who refused God's appeal. We've seen his miraculous work. We've seen his mighty hand. We've seen him all through our history. Let's not be like that. We need to heed now the appeal of the Holy Spirit. Today, we need to bend knee before a holy God and recognize that he is who he is. Let today be the day that you bend knee to Jesus Christ. Don't provoke him to the point even to where Herod comes, where in his anger he says, enough is enough. Off into eternity with you. So we believe God. Trust in him. Put your faith, your trust in his son who, who was sent to this very earth on our behalf, suffering sin's penalty for us so that for all who would believe that they might be forgiven of sin's penalty and might know the joy of entering his rest. For us as believers, if we have heard and responded to the gospel, then we must live each day in light of its truth. Each day bending knee, shining that light of Christ into a dark world. How we treat one another, how we treat the world around us. Let our thoughts, our actions, our relationships be acts of submission to that one and that same Holy Spirit, remaining on that bended knee, acknowledging he is Christ, and in him is the salvation from sin. In him is the power to live in a fallen world. Trust God's providence in the moment, whether in the checkout line or being chained between two guards hours from your execution. Trust God's got this. And the warning to those who have not responded to the gospel is in the exhortation to respond today. Don't harden your heart. The impotent have a common end. It is appointed for each of us to die once and then to face the judgment. Hebrews 9, verse 27, again, he's appealing to his Hebrew readers. Recognizing the, the outcome of unbelief, the rejection of God's witness all through the ages and even the moment of Christ appearing. He says this, just as is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. There's an accounting for all of us. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the truth. The day is coming. Don't harden your heart. Those who have responded to the gospel in faith and repentance will do so gladly and willingly and enjoy God's eternal blessing. But those that have hardened their hearts to the call of the gospel will do so with great fear and trembling and suffer God's wrath where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And we've seen just a little taste, a little bit, of the life of Herod. I don't think Herod wanted to be that kind of an example. But for us, it's a warning. For the church, it was a warning. All the more as we see the day coming. How urgent, how urgent can it be? Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Let today be the day of salvation. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, again for your holy word and even the sobriety, Lord, of recognizing apart from Jesus Christ, we are in great, great peril. For we have all sinned and fallen short of your great glory, a glory that is unreachable by any works of righteousness on our part. Apart from Jesus Christ, that we can only earn the wage that is rightfully ours and our sin offenses against you, a holy God, and that wage is eternal death, separation from you forever in a place called hell. But, oh, Father, we thank you that the goodness of God has been shown to us in the person of your son, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth. And though living a life without sin, doing completely and utterly that which you, the Father, asked him to do, he went to a cross and took our sin upon himself. He endured your wrath upon himself for our sake. So that all who would believe, all that would turn to him, would be forgiven of that sin and would enjoy the blessing of the forgiveness of sin, the joy of eternal life, the promise of ever being in your presence. And in that great event, we have the great witness of the resurrection, that which man cannot argue against. 
that indeed Jesus Christ is alive, and even now at the right hand of our Father who is in heaven, making his appeal on our behalf and on those who would be saved. Oh, Father, thank you for Jesus Christ, and in him is the forgiveness of sin. Father, our prayer is today, if there is one hearing these words, that, Lord, that if they've been playing the Herod game, if they've been putting you to test, O oh Lord, that your Holy Spirit would speak loudly and clearly to their heart today, that they would recognize this is a game that cannot be win, won. That the impotent cannot defeat the omnipotent. For only God can, can defeat that which is afflicting the very heart of man, and that is our sinfulness. And you've done that through your Son. May today be the day of salvation. May they bend knee even now to the gospel of Jesus Christ. May today... They cry out to, to you and say, oh, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. May today be the day of salvation. For us, Lord, who know you, what an affirmation to know that our God reigns. You are completely and utterly in control. There is no, no politician. There is no king. There is no man, woman. There is no spirit who is beyond your control. You indeed are God. And every knee will bow and every tongue confess that. Oh, Father, may that be our stance in this world. May your church join together on, upon their knees in holy submission to that truth, rejoicing. Indeed, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And in you is the forgiveness of sin. In you is life eternal. Oh, Father, I pray that your church would be the expression of complete and utter belief and all that you have made known to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that we can be reminded that even in trying times, we can have cause for joy. We can find reason for celebrate. May truly your church live that joy, live that peace, and live that harmony. All for your name's sake, we would pray, because we love you, our God. Amen.